Good evening, everyone. Seasons greetings, and uh, thank you, Prashant. Uh, here to talk about emerging opportunities in the consumer discretionary space. Now, consumer discretionary is something that's that's very close to all of us. You know, uh, it's a it's a it's a sector which is all about uh, living a good life. You know, feeling good, eating good, right? Uh, and and in some sense, also a, a signaling of how well we are doing in life, right? So it's a, it's a sector which is which is exciting. Something we can all uh, connect very well to. And uh, we strongly believe that India is at the cusp of, of a multi-decade growth in some of the consumer discretionary categories. And that makes it very, very exciting and interesting for us as, as, as investors who believe in bottom-up stock selection. And I'll talk through you know, some of these things in the Indian context over the next few slides and the next few minutes. Right? So uh, if you could move to the next one, they put you. So let me just start with the, you know, uh, looking at, at world's most valuable companies, right? We've just picked the top 50. And the ones shaded in green, right, are either what are names that are traditionally thought of as consumer discretionary companies, right, directly, or can be argued to be consumer discretionary companies. If you look at the top name there, Apple, right, is it a tech company or is it really a, a, a tech, you know, a, a consumer discretionary company that has a tech product, right? If you look at uh, you know, the lines outside Apple stores when a new iPhone is launched, right? it's, it's, it's really consumer discretionary, right? They, what they produce is a, is a tech product, a marvelous, you know, piece of, of gadgetry. But at the end of the day, it is a consumer discretionary play, right? And, and if you go through the names, right, you'll find various shades of consumer discretionary, some, as I said, directly consumer discretionary and some, which one can argue are really consumer discretionary plays, right? So close to 45% of the top 50 names uh, around 22 of these names, right, are can be linked to or can be argued to be consumer discretionary names. The other important point I wanted to make on on this slide was that you will see a very diverse set, uh, you know, set of of subsectors or subcategories, if you will, right. Apple is a tech company. You look at Amazon; it's an e-commerce company. Tesla is an auto company. Visa is a payment, you know, behemoth. You look at Walmart; it's it's really a, a the largest brick and mortar retailer in the world. Right. PNG is really a CPG company now. Again, partly consumer staples, but some of their portfolio is consumer discretionary. LVMH is a luxury goods company. Tencent is a gaming company. Right. And if you go through the list, you'll you'll find you know representations from the Alcobiv space. Uh, something like you know Quechao Motai in China, the largest Alcobiv company in China. Home Depot is really a home improvement company. Right. A retailer, the largest home home improvement retailer in the world with close to 155 billion dollars in sales. Right. Samsung, again, electronics. So you go through the list, you have an entertainment company in Walt Disney, uh, a food services company in McDonald's. So it's a, it's a sector with, with a very rich diversity. It touches, you know, uh, all aspects of a, of a household or a consumer's life, right? And, and that this is what makes it extremely interesting and extremely challenging at the same time. Uh, we can move to the next one, please. Now, just... To, to sort of differentiate between these two terms that you'll hear, right? Staples and discretionary, what, you know, differentiates a category. And there's a fine line, as I, as I also, you know, say on the slide that one man's staple can be another man's discretionary, right? What was discretionary for a particular household or a consumer 10 years back is probably has become a staple. I mean, do you, th do we think of smartphones as, as, as a staple category or a discretionary category today? For a good section of the population, it has become a staple. You can't live without it. Uh, forget for a day, maybe even for an hour, right? I remember, you know, uh, when one of my phones broke down, I, I got a new one within an hour. So, so it's as staple as it gets, right? And that's the fine line we are talking about. But just to differentiate, still differentiate between staples and discretionary, I've just put some attributes together. Right? The basic consumption driver of a staple category is really need. While when it comes to discretionary categories, it is more towards the want, desire, and aspiration end of the spectrum. Right? From a shopping experience perspective, right? uh, staples is a low involvement to medium involvement category, while the, while the consumer involvement when it comes to discretionary categories tends to be very, very high. That also extends to you know, how personalized are these categories. Right? Staples category is very, very narrow, while when it comes to discretionary, you know, there is a scope for very deep, very wide personalization. Right? Think of premiumization potential, right? staples, uh, let's take a category, let's take soaps. Right? Uh, if you take a standard 100 gram bar of soap, the range of soaps available in the market, if I look at 99% of value in the market, it will be between 20 rupees to 100 rupees, right? So it's a 5x. Now think of ladies' handbags or shoes, right? 
sports shoes or or sneakers available in the market you can get a sneaker for 200 rupees and at the top end right it, it can go as high as 20000 even if you take this the outliers out right so discretionary categories also tend to have a very fat tail on the right side right and a significant part of value coming from you know uh, premium products right and again because this is a a a, a play on desires and aspirations this premium fashion journey can actually be unlimited in a way right and hence you see names like lvmh and hermes right these names which have created significant wealth these are all premium plays right uh now coming to the the impact of this on on financials right what you see in terms of roc range in these sectors right in staples it's, it tends to be a fairly narrow range when it comes to discretionary with with a couple of outliers right but but otherwise a very tight band but in discretionary categories this can be extremely wide right and lastly leverage to disposable income growth when disposable income grows In a, in a in a country or an economy, staples have a low leverage to it, while discretionary categories tend to have a significantly higher multiplier, right? Which makes it very interesting in a in a fast growing economy, which we all expect India to be, right? For for uh, many many years to come. And what all of this leads to, from an investment standpoint, is that the value creation skew between companies tends to be low to medium when it comes to consumer staples, but extremely high when it comes to discretionary. and what that means for bottom of stock selection you know investors like us is the sector can be a gold mine where if we do our job well we can pick you know very attractive opportunities uh, which can be long term wealth compounders uh, move to the next one please this again just talking about the diversity rich diversity and and the wide spectrum of uh, you know opportunities in the sector uh, this is just you know uh, from an industry classification standpoint if you look at consumer discretionary it has various subgroups right from retailing to autos to consumer durables apparel consumer services uh, you know including food services etc then healthcare uh, recreation or entertainment and even home improvement specialty chemicals you know paints construction chemicals and all but the underlying drivers if you think about it on the right hand side right and some of these drivers may impact some of these subsectors more than the others but the underlying drivers really are demographic changes growth in incomes household incomes disposable income internet penetration has become an extremely important driver in this sector because it it creates aspiration right aspiration is very important to development of a of a consumer discretionary category the overall financial tech ecosystem think of uh, you know the availability of of easy financing for for durables right that unleashes you know consumer uh, discretionary you know certain consumer discretionary categories and one of the recent trends which is you know work from home which is on its way down but that has also had an impact on certain consumer discretionary companies right uh, moving to the next one yeah now this is what we believe about the indian consumer discretionary space we believe it's a potential multi decade growth opportunity we are talking about 300 million households 1.4 billion people uh, it's a lot of aspiration out there right and and most of these households and consumers are at the beginning of their discretionary consumption cycle which can go on for decades as long as income growth you know plays out uh, the way one is uh, thinking or forecasting it to be because ultimately consumer discretionary you know and and pardon uh, me for using a loose word but you know magic in consumer discretionary happens when three things come together disposable income aspirations and access right think about wireless broadband it used to be a discretionary you know consumption item till a few years back and the geo moment when it happened right aspiration was all, already uh, you know already there uh, the the pricing that geo came out came out with you know bridged the gap between uh, or made made the service more affordable so in this case the pricing came down to the income levels in some sense right in certain other categories incomes grow to the the, the quote unquote you know pricing of the good or service right and access improved significantly as you know pan india 4g networks were set up both by jio uh, airtel and and over time by vodafone idea as well and the sort of explosion we saw in data volumes in india right we are talking about in the last 6 years and i have compared uh, june 22 quarter to june 16 because that was the quarter pre jio the data volumes in india have grown 82 times this is a 108% kicker right of course one can argue whether you know what kind of value growth for the sector this has uh, resulted in etc but the more important point is this unleashed you know a, a quote unquote consumer discretionary category when these three things came together right uh, internet as i said has democratized aspirations and with you know a lot of organized retailers as well as uh, you know expanding significantly and uh, you know e-commerce companies serving pretty much all pin codes in the country right even access to some extent is is rapidly getting democratized right so it's all coming together in 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 some sense 
that's it right a lot of these categories because they're in nascent stage require effective development from industry players right category development is extremely important the way some of these categories will shape up right depends on how well the players in that category you know shape uh, consumer behavior and and try and bring this 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 trioka right where magic happens together in some sense right because you know it is as much a intra category market share fight for companies as it is inter category wallet share fight between categories right so so that that is also very critical and category champions uh what we've seen empirically in, in a lot of other markets category development champions actually create massive long term wealth for shareholders again think of think of the the the, the, the most uh, the highest you know market cap company in the world apple they created a category right of smartphones touch screen smartphones you know in a way and they've, they've created multiple categories over time right the risk to all of this right is because if you think of aspirations they're there uh, access is improving the risk is slower than expected growth in disposable income that has to play out for this category to deliver on its promise over the long run uh, move to the next one this really is a representation again we're looking at underlying drivers here and uh, you know again to be very clear not trying to stereotype or generalize here but the indian consumer is changing it is increasingly more aspirational more expressive there's just a comparison of a typical right again not trying to stereotype but but an average gen y pre millennial you know consumer uh, to a gen z and millennial that the lifestyle is completely different right uh yolo is, is is the new new term that that you know is is, is in vogue in, in 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 the millennial generation you only live once so people are 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 willing to consume early one way to also think about this is if you were to think of let's say the qsr industry the lifetime value of someone who was born in the last 15 20 years or who's yet to be born in this country right uh for someone for the entire qsr industry the lifetime value for the qsr industry of someone who's born today is significantly higher than someone who was born 10 years back or 20 years back right they consume a lot more of of food outside home right uh, than he does inside home right so and you can think of uh, a similar framework for a lot of other categories and the ltv of of the new consumer right is 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 or people who are going to enter the consumption class over the next few years is going to be significantly higher than than the existing ones right and that's that's the that's that's what create, will will end up creating significant value in a lot of categories right uh, move to the next one just a few you know core drivers here right uh, and and there are many but uh, you know we've just picked three uh, the first one that you see on the top left hand side is really the 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 income pyramid if you will in the country which is going to move from pyramid to a to a diamond right and and, and that that's the base case expectation that we are going to have uh, a significantly larger you know middle class in the country the aspirant class or the struggler class is is going to actually shrink in absolute terms and will become a much lower share of population right over time right uh, the second one as i said internet uh, given the, cost, the how how you know quickly uh, the cost of of internet access have gone down you have had significant increase or jump in internet penetration which has fueled aspirations right and the last one of course the young population of india which was the last point i made these three are the fundamental drivers again you're talking about income uh access right internet also sort of improves access thanks to you know uh, the e-commerce penetration in this country the reach of of e-commerce and then of course aspirations which is partly linked to the, the median age which is which is you know uh, fairly young in, in in our country right so these are these are really the the core underlying drivers what you see on the next slide is how inflection in in specific categories and this again is is, is a more generalized version of how things play out in an average country india could be different right uh because consumption patterns right uh tend to be very different right they're, they're similar to some extent and they tend also tend to be uh different in, in different countries in fact just as a matter of trivia uh there are only two categories large categories that i, I that that <clears throat> you know where india's per capita consumption is actually and on a per capita basis consumption is higher than the world and those two categories are gold and edible oil right those are cultural nuances of, of various countries and and uh that that come to four but this is a, a very generalized view on which categories take off at various per capita levels basis experience of other countries that have gone through this journey right and you'll see that a lot of consumer discretionary categories uh you know see uh, an inflection point as you know countries move through this per capita curve india currently is at about two and a half thousand dollars as we you know 
travel from this two and a half to three, three and a half, four, five, six, and over time, you know, hopefully reach much higher levels. A lot of these categories are going to see significant inflation because ultimately, what you see here is an aggregate of what a lot of individual households and consumers do, right? And uh, if you think of a movement of an individual household from a particular income level to a let's say two x income level, right? Some of the categories that are already being consumed will not go up to x. At higher disposable income, we'll add categories to the consumption basket, and those tend to be more discretionary categories because staples is already being consumed. Right? So that's really the message on this slide. Uh, move to the next one. This again is you know highlighting the low penetration of several categories in India. You look at branded apparel, much much below you know both China and US. We just use these two as as comparables. Food services again significantly below. Beverages consumption significantly below. Right. Uh, so to that extent, the opportunity for per capita consumption to go up, uh, and hence overall aggregate consumption in some of these categories to go up is significant. Right. Moving to the next one. Now that said, we we as I said, you know the, there is uh, going to be a wide uh, variation in uh, the skew or, or or very very you know wide skew in in performance across companies. Right. We have just taken an example. Uh, uh, or uh, for, from an illustration perspective, from the apparel retail space, and looked at let's say three different quote unquote uh, sets of companies, if you will, right? Uh, this has been the right space overall. Branded apparel space has you know organized space has grown, I think, forty x in the last twenty years, right? Of a very small base, but there are companies who have executed well, companies that have not been able to execute well, and companies which have executed extremely poorly, right? If you look at the the second column from the left, right, this is a company that has done extremely well, right, and and from an illustration perspective, we pick pick trend for this, right. Uh, the ten year returns from the stock have been have been about thirty one percent bigger. The stock has gone up close to you know fifteen sixteen times, and if you look at some of the underlying metrics, right, uh, they represent a well run retailer, a very well run retail operation, and there is a lot that has gone into creating what you see as the trend of today, right. The second, the middle column really is uh, from an illustration perspective. We picked an ABFRL again, the same space, but they've made poor choices, and their execution has actually been average. Right, and the result, net result has been while the stock has you know delivered some returns, it has been subpar below below you know market returns. The stock is up about three x in the last ten years for about a, a seven percent gain. Uh, and and the last one really is is spectacular uh, failures that that we've seen several of them in in the space. Right, companies that have gone down. And they've made very very poor choices, and uh, you know uh, run their operations extremely poorly, right? And a lot of them have gone bankrupt or end up being massive well destroyers. So stock selection still remains key to returns given the wide skew that one will see in operational performance and financial discipline across uh, various subsectors, right? Across companies in various subsectors. Uh, moving to the next one. This again, you know, these are global examples, and uh, we picked examples to illustrate the point that value creation can happen across consumer discretionary categories, right? So you'll you'll see, you know, uh, examples from you know something like Lean Inc, right, which is actually a, a, an athleisure footwear player in China, right, a local player which has competed with global players like Nike, Adidas, and all. And has still created significant value. You'll also see Anta in the list. These are two Chinese, you know, sports and athleisure companies, right? Uh, primarily footwear, but also into other sports and athleisure categories, right? So homegrown companies can compete well. Uh, that's that's you know uh, uh, one point you know we wanted to make on this one. The second name that you see is Lululemon, extremely niche category. This company started as a yoga pants company, but has you know gradually built on that uh, core. Uh, consumer uh, promise and 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 built its business into other categories, right? You'll also see Dino Polska, which is actually a small Polish retailer, right? Uh, a restoration hardware, which which is actually a furniture company, right? A retailer, furniture retailer, Apple, uh, Costco. These are well-known names. Hermes, LVMH on in the luxury space. Uh, uh, Motai, as I said, in the Alcobev space. Home Depot, right? In one of the most boring spaces, if you will, a home improvement retailer. Right, exceptional performance in the in the last ten odd years. Just a steady compounder, right? And you'll see McDonald's, right, which is the the leading food services chain in the in the world. And all of these companies have outperformed, you know, both the MSCI World Consumer Discretionary Index and and the EM Consumer Discretionary, uh, you know, for for companies where that is the relevant index, right, by a significant margin because we are talking about you know five and ten year returns here, right? So. Performance can happen across categories, right? But again, uh, what we could have also shown is companies that have destroyed value in the same sectors, 
right? And there are a number of them. If you think of just the just the apparel retail space globally, right? While uh, you know, or let's say the lifestyle space, someone like an Nike has created value. You know, there are many other companies who destroy a lot of value, right? Uh, or take Costco, right? Which is a, a, a retailer in the US. Several retailers have either gone down. Uh, think of names like Sears and an interesting uh, phrase I, I, I read on Sears is that it is the slowest liquidation in, in, in uh, you know, the history of corporate America. Right? It continues to go down. The, the, the company hasn't, uh, you know, gone bankrupt yet, but it continues to go down, right? So there are uh, similar examples on the other side as well, and that, that's what makes stock selection extremely critical. Right? Move to the next one. And now the investable universe in India, right? has expanded significantly in this space. This is uh, the, the number of consumer discretionary names in BSE 500. If you look at September 12, there were a total of 35 names split roughly equally between autos and ex-autos or non-autos. If you look at it today, there are 71 names and 43 out of these, close to 60% is non-auto names uh, with several listings in, in several niche segments, right? In the, only in the past two, two and a half, three years, right? You look at names like Metro, Manever, uh, when it comes to KFC Pizza, the two franchises of Yum Brands in India, uh, restaurant brands which runs Burger King in India, EMIL, which is an electronics retailer, Go Colors in the fashion space, Campus again in the footwear space, Nika, the leading BPC, uh, you know, e-retailer in India, or let's call it leading BPC retailer now with their offline presence. Uh, Zomato, one of the, you know, food delivery companies in India, Barbecue Nation, again, another casual dining company. So across, you know, uh, several subcategories you've seen. Uh, very interesting names, companies that have uh, a lot of promise, and we are invested in some of those. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about one of those as a, as a case study towards the end. Right? Move to the next one. Now, how do we evaluate consumer discretionary companies? Our basic framework of evaluating companies still remains the same. Right? However, the the, uh, the the specific tools, the the specific metrics, techniques that we apply, right, to to evaluate companies in the space could be different. And and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details here, but what is most important really is one, identifying what the business really is about. Is it a product brand or a retailer in the space, right? Uh, paying equal attention to the front end as well as the back end. And most importantly, because this in this sector, you can grow very fast, but the discipline uh, from a financials perspective, when you're, when you're doing so, right? You can open, you know, if a 50 store chain can open hundred stores by taking one day. And you've seen a lot of companies go down because they, they try to grow too fast without having the, the necessary discipline and the backend infrastructure to be able to support that. Right? So growth for the sake of it is what kills companies here. So discipline growth is, is what we're looking for uh, from a financial discipline standpoint. There is a, a healthy trade-off between incremental ROIC and growth that companies need to strike from a financial standpoint. And that's what we look for. Move to the next one. Now, this is, these are just a couple of frameworks, you know, because we, we look for great companies. So a couple of frameworks that we apply in this sector and, and, and pardon the colors on this, we, we, we couldn't get, get better colors and make it, make it a little, little prettier, but what this framework really is an expectations delivery framework. What you see on the, on the horizontal axis is the range of expectations from a consumer standpoint. And on the vertical axis is, you know, the delivery of various companies, right? So there are companies who deliver below consumer expectation, companies which deliver above consumer expectation. And in the, in the middle, there is a, a average zone. There's an above average and below average zone. The companies that are above that is what we call the, the zone of greatness. And companies below the below average zone is the zone of mediocrity, right? Companies, but the more important nuance is, even though this sector really is still being developed, as I said, a lot of categories are still being developed. You'll also see, I mean, this is not a static, you know, view is, is the point. It's a, it's a dynamic chart in some sense because there are companies which are shaping expectations. Right? They're actually creating new expectations, enhancing customer expectations, right? And if they continue to deliver above those enhanced expectations, that is when you create exceptional experience, what you see on the top right hand side. And then even from a value perspective, there are companies which are pushing limits on value. Think of a DMART, for example, right? That's when, that's when you start delivering exceptional value. So you can be a great company by, by picking the, the value end of consumer expectation, or you can be a great company in this space by picking the experience end of the cons of consumer expectation, right? You can, but, but it's a K, right? K has become the favorite word in the last couple of years. There is, you know, the, the middle is really where you don't want to be. You either offer exceptional value or offer exceptional experience in a way, right? And that's, that's what leads to greatness over time, right? Let's move to the next slide, please. 
So the second, you know, uh, test for greatness that we look for is a single word, really remarkability, uh, whether a consumer discretionary company or any company for that matter is, is a remarkable company or not. And this is especially true in the consumer discretionary B2C space. And by remarkability, what I really mean is uh, the company, uh, you know, the company's customers, right? Take the story or narrative of the company to other, you know, potential customers, right? The company has to deliver a consumer experience that that makes its customers, you know, talk about the brand, talk about the company. How do you do this? You do this by delivering consumer delight as opposed to just customer satisfaction. The key word here is, is, is really wow. What I really mean is, uh, good enough is no longer good enough. Uh, the company also has to deliver a, a very strong reason slash purpose and not just a strong what. So, uh, and, and really, if I, if I were to capture this in 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 short, right, this, this quote by uh, Schopenhauer, a German philosopher in the 19th century captures it very well. He says, talent, it's a target that no one else can hit, whereas genius, it's a target that no one else can see. Now, given this, the stage of evolution of the consumer discretionary sector in India. Uh, we are looking at companies that can shape categories that can actually uh, sort of not just deliver on on uh, express needs, but also you know unleash latent needs and hit targets that you know the customers or or you know us as investors can't see and, and end up surprising all of us positively. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So what we have here is uh, a couple of case studies of companies that we've invested in over time. And these are, again, what we believe are two remarkable companies, you know, both in the apparel space, but uh, different subcategories, uh, Jockey in the innerwear space and Manever in the uh, in the men's ethnic wear and increasingly the women's ethnic wear slash wedding wear, uh, you know, space. Uh, absolutely remarkable companies. They have shaped their respective categories, <coughs> executed brilliantly over years. And this reflects in... Uh, you know, significantly better than competition financial matrix, uh, consistent growth. Uh, so all of this really, you know, whatever we've discussed so far in terms of what makes a company remarkable, what makes a company great, exceptional, et cetera, sort of gets, gets illustrated very well with these two examples. One of these is a recent listing, and this is what we mean by, uh, you know, the, the, the increase in or, or opportunities that, that we as public market investors have in this space.